sense. You know, I'm just so passionate about this work and I'm looking at all the messages coming up and it's like people are from all over the world, which tells me that this topic is really still needed to be talked about. I'm an adoptee. I'm in reunion with both uh, families. I'm also in recovery from drugs and alcohol for 33 years. And I tell you this not to impress you, but just to let you know that it is possible and it is possible for us adopted people to do the work and, and um, enjoy our lives <laughs> regardless of the trauma. Um, I first heard the word relinquishment actually from Paul Sunderland many years ago who speaks about adoptees and addicts. And the further I go in this journey, I realized that relinquishment really is, is the trauma. Um, I met Gabor, gosh, about seven years ago, I sent him an article I wrote about becoming a mother. And we started this conversation about the lifelong impact really of adoption and how milestones can re-trigger the adoption experience. I read his book, um, he, has a, he has a few wonderful books, but the book I want to share in the realm of Hungry Ghosts was so impactful for me in many ways. And I think it was like the first person that I had read where he was looking underneath the trauma. He wasn't, you know, looking at just the addiction. It wasn't even about that. It was like, what is underneath? Why are people behaving in this way? What do they need? And another um, thing that he said is, you know, acting, we're actually acting normally in an abnormal situation. And that again was so profound for me as an adoptee because I've always felt abnormal you know, like trying to get through life and feeling like the problem. And the more I've explored and done the work on myself and reading his work, it's like, oh, actually I was acting normally to an abnormal situation. And I'm gonna pass it on to Gabor and ask him really the main question is what are the challenges that adopted babies, children face in their lives? And we'll start it from there. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. It's lovely to see you. Thanks, Sarah. It's great to see you again. It's been a few years since we walked in New York, I think. But um, a, lot of, a lot of things have happened since then. So my, um, my interest in the question of adoption began before I dealt with addictions, actually. Uh, it was, I was in my 50s when I was diagnosed with ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And it, it, it became apparent to me very quickly that contrary to the accepted medical opinion that this is an inherited genetic disease, it's actually something else entirely. And how, how adoption came into the picture is that I, as I did the research, turns out that if you have ADHD, your risk of, in an ADHD population, the risk of having been adopted is eight to 16 times that of the average. In other words, adopted kids have far greater risk for ADHD than non-adopted kids. And then if you look at the literature, the same thing is true. Adopted kids have four times the risk of suicide, multiple risk of anxiety, depression, all manner of so-called mental illnesses. And so then the question is why? Well, the clue for me had to do with my own understanding of ADHD originally, again, before I looked at addictions. And when you look at ADHD as, an, as a syndrome, the hallmark of it is the tuning out, the absent-mindedness, the non-presence. Well, that's not a disease. That's a nature-given mechanism to deal with stress. In other words, when people are stressed, and they can't change the situation or leave it, their minds or their brains will kind of disconnect to protect them from the impact of the stress. And I knew something on my own infancy. Well, I knew a lot about it, which was a Jewish infant under the Nazis in Eastern Europe. So you can imagine that in my first year of life, I had a lot of the reasons to tune out. In other words, I didn't have a disease, I had a normal response to an abnormal situation of war, privation, illness, and genocide. 
And so that that made me understand that a lot of what we call mental illness is actually, or dysfunction is a response to abnormal circumstances. Now, when it comes to adoption, now relinquishment is an interesting word. I mean, it's accurate, but it's kind of neutral. Like I can relinquish, I have this cup of tea in my hand, I can relinquish it. So while it's technically accurate that adopted people are relinquished by their birth parents, the child doesn't experience relinquishment. The child experiences abandonment. So that in a certain sense that not that anybody means to abandon them, you know, the birth mother might very well want the best for the child and the adopted parents, they want the best for the child. We're not talking about what the adults want or what their intentions are. We're talking about the emotional experience of the infant. And that is one of abandonment. But the problem begins long before then. Because the brain develops under the impact of the environment and that begins already in utero. So let me read you a paragraph from an article on brain development, childhood development from the Harvard Center on the Developing Child, published in the leading pediatric journal, Pediatrics, which is the official journal of the American Pediatric Academy. And this article published in 2012, sums up brain development in this short paragraph in two sentences. The architecture of the brain is constructed through an ongoing process that begins before birth, continues into adulthood, and establishes either a sturdy or a fragile foundation for all, all the health, learning, and behavior that follows. So the architecture of the brain is constructed through an ongoing process that begins before birth. And what that means is, that the emotional states of the mom have an impact on the developing brain of the infant. Now think about any mother who's gonna give up a baby for adoption. By definition, they're a stressed mother, 99% of the time. They're a single mom, they're an abused mom, they're an evicted mom, they're a poor mom, uh, they are a young teenager with her support. That's stressful. For nine months, the hormones of stress that the mother is secreting, cortisol and adrenaline, are going through to the infant. And cortisol and, and, and adrenaline have a huge impact, a negative impact on brain development. And so that we know from animal studies that if you stress pregnant animals in the laboratory deliberately, their offspring will be more likely to use cocaine and alcohol to soothe themselves as adults. We're talking about animals in the laboratory. We know from human studies that uh, in war zones or after 9-11, multiple studies, that uh, the stress on the mom and the trauma on the mom during the pregnancy changes the functioning of the genes of the infant into adolescence and even beyond perhaps. So that when we're talking about adoption, it doesn't just begin at birth. The issue does not begin at birth. It begins right at conception. Furthermore, in my therapeutic work, I've dealt with quite a few people who are adopted or just not wanted. I mean, it's, it, it, this, this sense of not being wanted doesn't just apply to adopted kids. A lot of parents you know, sustain a pregnancy and they didn't want that kid. And it's hard for them. You know, They come to terms with it, but really there's a lot of anxiety and stress there. That sense of not being wanted, that I'm an outsider who isn't wanted, which a lot of other people, adopted people, carry with them. Also exists in a lot of people who are not adopted, but who simply weren't wanted. And that sense actually begins to be embedded or ingrained in utero. 
beyond conscious memory. But, and I'm going to talk to you about memory in a little while. So then, so all that happens. Then there is the birth. Now, here's the thing about birth. If you look at any mammal, any mammal from monkeys to chimpanzees to rats to human beings, the infant is born and is helpless. None of them are as helpless as a human infant, by the way. We stay helpless and dependent much longer than any other creature. But that infant is born with a certain expectation. And when I say expectation, I don't mean like a conscious, I expect you to do such and such. I mean an inborn expectation. For example, your lungs are an expectation for oxygen. Your lungs evolved, the human lung evolved in an environment where there was oxygen. Had there been no oxygen on earth, there'd be no human beings. There might be other creatures, but there wouldn't be humans. And there shouldn't be creatures with lungs because lungs expect oxygen. A mammalian infant is an expectation for nurturing because otherwise they don't survive. Immediate contact with the mother. Rats immediately start licking their infants. That's their form of nurturing. All animals do that. Human beings are an expectation at birth of being placed on the mother's belly. The child migrates towards the breast and latches on. That's what they're an expectation for. In a lot of other adoptions, that doesn't happen. Now, for nine months, that infant was gestated in the uterus, hearing the voice of the mother, registering the heartbeat of the mother, attuning with the biorhythms of the mother, receiving and being encased in the electrum Electro, electromagnetic radiation emitted by the mother's heart. The expectation is that it will continue in this environment. In fact, for the infant, the first nine months outside the uterus have been called extero gestation, gestation outside the uterus, because for the human being, it takes about nine months to get to the same point of development as most other mammals are already at birth. So the expectation is that extero gestation will continue that's utterly broken for the adopted child. Now, necessarily, and the problem, as I'll be telling you, is not simply that these things happen, but that until recently, and even now, we haven't had a sufficient appreciation of what happens to that infant and how to compensate for it. So adoptive parents with the best of goodwill think, okay, I'll have this baby, I'll love the baby, everything's gonna be okay. But from the baby's point of view, nothing is okay, given what I've just told you happened. So that's the first paragraph, that's the first sentence, that the, that the architecture of the brain is constructed to an ongoing process that begins before birth, continues into adulthood, and establishes either a sturdy or a fragile foundation for all the health, learning, and behavior that follow. So adopted kids have learning problems, behavior problems. That's the first sentence. The second sentence, the interactions of genes and experiences literally shapes the circuitry of the developing brain. But that means that the way the brain circuits develop, the brain circuits of self-regulation, emotional regulation, self-worth, sense of connection, the brain chemicals that are implicated in mental health, such as serotonin, the endorphins, the dopamine, and so on. These all develop in interaction with the parents. The genes don't determine them. The genes provide the potentials, but it takes the environment to trigger the potentials. So, the interaction of genes and experiences literally shapes the circuitry of the developing brain and is critically influenced by the mutual responsiveness of adult-child relationships, particularly in the early childhood years. Mutual responsiveness. 
Now that primarily means the capacity of the parent to attune to the emotional needs of the infant. We're not talking about whether your adoptive parent or any parent loves the child or not. We're not talking about whether or not they mean their best. We're talking about how attuned are they to the child's emotional states. And it's hard on uh, adoptive parents because they expect. Now, this is, I'm talking about adoption at birth. Never mind when adoption happens at age three or four or five, by which time a whole set of traumas have been added on to the original trauma of, of abandonment. But the parents also have an expectation of a child that wants to connect with them. And that triggers the parent's parenting instincts. However, if a child is already a bit withdrawn because they're afraid to open up, because they've been hurt, and the child is a bit reticent, the parent himself or herself, they feel rejected. And then they act from that position of hurt. So now you have two hurt people interacting. Everybody loves everybody. Everybody means all the best. These are unconscious dynamics. But they almost inevitably show up in a lot of adoptions. Then, of course, what happens is a lot of adoptions don't happen right at birth. I mean, ideally they would but often they don't. That child may have been, first of all, in the home of the biological parents, where there's a whole lot of dysfunction, and therefore the child has to leave that home, and that dysfunction has an impact on the child's self-worth and brain and personality. Then they go to a foster situation, and then they're abandoned by that, you know, to be adoptive, and I say abandoned, I mean, from the child's perspective. So one broken attachment after another. That child does not develop a sense of safety in the world, a sense of belonging. If everybody's giving me away, there must be something wrong with me. The child cannot help but make that assumption. So that child goes up with a negative self-worth. And a lot of adopted people have an exaggerated sense of rejection in the sense that they're in a relationship and their partner is a sullen one day the adopted person, oh my God, they're rejecting me. They're not being rejected. The person is just sullen that day. But the emotional pain is that of abandonment. Now, I've told the story before. Pardon me if you heard it. Uh, I, but I won't even tell you the basic story. I just tell you that in my relationship with my spouse of 51 years, rejection or abandonment is a constant theme. In other words, I've often felt the pain of abandonment and rejection in situations that didn't in any way resemble it. Well, only very vaguely, like say she, my wife doesn't show up to pick me up at the airport. <gasps> I'm 71. <gasps> well, what's that? When I was a year old, my mother did give me to a stranger and I didn't see her for five or six weeks. And she did that to save my life. Well, the British psychiatrist John Bowlby did some studies of kids who didn't see their mothers, young kids, for a while because they were hospitalized. And in those days in Britain, parents were told not to visit their kids when they're hospital because it's too upsetting to see their parent come and go. Wrong advice, but that's the advice that parents got. So these mothers didn't see their kids for a while. When, when, the, when the mother did come back, how did the child respond? Most of them didn't even look at the mom. And that's called defensive withdrawal, which simply means it's a, it's a coping mechanism. The child's brain, not the child consciously, but the child's brain says, I was so hurt when you abandoned me that I'm not gonna open myself up again to that kind of rejection. And that then becomes a lifelong pattern. And certainly that's been my pattern. I wasn't even adopted. I just didn't see my mom for five weeks, but for an infant, five weeks is an eternity. I asked my mom, after I read those studies, I asked her, mom, how did I respond to you when we were reunited? She said, like an utter stranger, you didn't even look at me for several days. And that has shown up in my relationship with my spouse decades later. 
Not that I can remember being given to a stranger when I was a year old, but you see, there's different kinds of memory. This is key here. There is conscious recall memory, but you can call back, you can recall what you did yesterday, you can recall what you did on a certain day at age 10. But that's explicit memory, recall memory. But then there's implicit memory, where you don't recall the incident, but the emotional memory is embedded in your nervous system. So the emotional memory of abandonment, nobody recalls being given to a stranger on their first day of birth. But people remember the emotional pain of it. And precisely because they don't recall the incident, like if, if my wife doesn't pick me up at the airport, you know, I said, oh, I feel just like I did when my mother gave me to a stranger at a year old, there'd be no problem. Because then I'd recognize that this isn't about the present moment. But precisely because I don't recall what happened, I'm just experiencing the emotion of it. I think it's because she's not picking me up at the airport. But it's actually an implicit memory. So to sum this up, the human infant is an expectation for a certain kind of experience. The mammalian experience of being held and nurtured by the person that gave birth to them. In adoption, for all kinds of valid reasons, of course, that doesn't happen. But the infant doesn't understand those valid reasons. And so the emotions of it are embedded in the infant's nervous system and, 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 and brain. There's a sense of abandonment, rejection, uh, not being good enough, not being wanted, being a stranger, being an outsider. No wonder then there's a higher risk for all these conditions that I talked about. And until very recently, we didn't necessarily know all this. Even now, I'm not sure that adoptive parents are informed just what a challenge they're facing, although I think we're getting a lot better than we used to be. So the result is that all kinds of well-meaning people uh, have had outcomes for their children that they never intended and never imagined. Now, there's one more thing. The spiritual teacher Apatoli says that whenever there's anger, there's always pain underneath it. There's a lot of anger in uh, adopted people for all that happened to them. Of course, as children, often they had to suppress that anger just to get along with their environment. Then it often shows up in adulthood, in relationships. And um, the pain of it all at some point will lead lost some people to escape the pain and the addictions, as Zara was saying, is nothing but an escape from pain. It's just an attempt to soothe the pain. So rather than just focusing on these behaviors and character traits, let's look at the reality that these are normal responses to an abnormal situation. When I say abnormal, I mean, it's not the way nature intended it. Maybe it's the way it had to be. And a lot of people have legitimate reasons to be very grateful for the fact that they were adopted. And some people can even get to the point of gratitude to the adoptive parents for offering them an opportunity for a better life. But that takes an adult perspective to understand all that. And underneath that adult understanding, there's still a whole lot of emotional pain and anger and a sense of uh, rejection. So that's, I think, where I'll stop and we can take Zara's comments or any questions. Yeah, well, I thank you so much for that. I've been jotting down notes and so much what, what you said makes absolute sense to me. Um, the self-soothing, Absolutely, that's, you know, the drugs and alcohol, self-soothing, the, the implicit memory. I feel like most of my life I, I was running on that, those unspoken feelings that I didn't understand when I was younger. And what I love that you, when you were talking about babies, because 
I think as an adoptee, I was left in a hospital for 10 days, then I was fostered for six weeks, then my mum and dad, you know, then, then I went to them. And, you know, talking earlier when I was saying, um, I felt like I was the problem because I wasn't connecting with my mother the way she wanted me to connect with her. And when I had my son, and that's when I had sent you the articles that I was writing about motherhood, it was so profound for me. During the pregnancy, I got in touch with cellular feelings around what it was like for my birth mother and what it was like for me in a way that I, and it was so painful. And then I had my baby, which was absolutely wonderful, but the fear that he was gonna disappear. I literally thought he was gonna disappear in thin air. It made no sense. I, you know, I carried him all the time in a sling in the end because I didn't want people to know that I thought he was going to vanish. It was very real for me. And, you know, as my baby, I have three children, but for my first, as I got to know him, you know, but I knew him the minute he was born because I was in tune with him during the pregnancy. Mm. And I would, you know, it got to like six weeks, eight weeks, the time when I was separated, when I, you know, finally rather was with my adopted mother. And I realized babies know everything. Babies know everything. And it's so hard for me sometimes to accept that people don't get that. Why don't they get that when you take a baby away, it's going to have feelings around that. But like you say, it's the cellular memory. Um, and um, so absolutely. And, and, and it's funny, I think sometimes I've met so many adoptees and sometimes their birth mothers have spoken to them during pregnancy. And, and I even feel that those adoptees do a little better. My birth mother pretended I didn't exist. And talk about the all knowing, uh, we uh, just very briefly, there was a uh, questionnaire that somebody wanted her to do. Did you talk to your baby during pregnancy? And then they wanted me to fill out the questionnaire for some uh, you know, degree somebody was working on. And my birth mother said, I don't think you're going to like what I wrote. You know, we wrote them separately and they asked us the same question. Did you speak to your baby? And then they'd say to me, what did you feel in the first trimester, second trimester, third trimester? And I had written, I felt like I was knocking on a door and nobody was there. Nobody was talking to me. And mm. then when I did read hers, it was, I ignored my baby. I wanted to have an abortion. I ignored my baby. I knew it. We know this stuff anyway. And the sad thing is when we are adopted and the adopted parents, like you say, it's not their fault. You know, they are coming to attach. They're so excited to meet their baby. And the baby's looking at a complete stranger. The baby doesn't, cannot attach because by that time, you know, and I always say to adopted parents, it's not your fault. We cannot attach. We just can't do it probably by that point. But there are other tools that we have to learn to, um, um, you know, to work around those traumas. And one of the questions actually, which ties in with this is somebody had said, have you observed cases where adoptees are misdiagnosed with a major mental illness? Because the symptoms related to their trauma mimic symptoms of other illness. And I just want to say when I did have my baby and I was so emotional, luckily I was working with a therapist because a doctor had said, you have postpartum depression. And she said, no, you just are feeling your grief. And that's when I started writing about motherhood and I had adoptees emailing me and saying, oh my God, I felt the same as you. There was nothing wrong with us again. It's like we were reacting to a situation. We were just working through it with our children. So um, I'm gonna read you a couple of the questions from all these sheets and then we'll look. I'm seeing there's like a whole bunch here. Let me just say something. Let me just say yes, something. Yes. Um, in some cultures, they actually sing to the baby in the uterus. Yes. They actually sing to them. They, they have their own song. And when they're born, they welcome them with that song. I love that. A lot of traditional cultures do that. So, it, you know, it, it's, it's um, and babies do know. Yeah, they know. And I mean, and I, I, I've, I've had people undergo psychedelic experiences 
and they actually remember the pain in the womb. Well, I felt like I was rebirthing during, I was pregnant and I'd start having yeah. these nightmares of rebirthing. I mean, I didn't yeah. tell people because they would think I was literally nuts. You know, the fear was, don't tell anybody these deep feelings, they're gonna take my baby away before it's even born. So, you know, I say to all you adoptee people out there or becoming mothers, if you experience this deep feeling around the births of your children, it, it, it really is normal. And I knew my birth mother by that point, but it didn't make any difference. Now, as to the point about misdiagnosed mental illnesses, mm. this is a longer conversation, but it's not that adopted people are mistaken to have mental illnesses because their symptoms resemble them. All mental illnesses are response to trauma. So that what we call mental illness in general, this is a much broader conversation, is all most one point of view, which I totally have subscribed to, is that all mental illness, what we call mental illnesses are actually all responses to um, painful life experiences, not just among the abducted people, but in general. Interesting. Yeah. And, and would you say that all addicts have experienced childhood trauma? Yeah, so here's the thing, not everybody who's traumatized will be addicted, but everybody who's addicted was traumatized. And, uh, and traumatized, trauma simply means a wound. They suffered a, a deep wound. Yeah. That often that they're not aware of. And, you know, I've had plenty of conversations with people who thought they had really happy childhoods, but then, you know, it takes three minutes. You ask a few questions and it turns out there was a lot of pain in that childhood. And how people deal with pain in childhood is they suppress it because it's too much to bear. If you can't share it, you bury it. And um, if you can't carry it, you bury it. But that doesn't mean that it goes away. It just lives in your subconscious and then acts up and uh, creates problems. So yes, all addicted people have suffered significant wounding in childhood. That's why the addiction. And so my mantra on addiction, and thanks for mentioning my book, In the Realm of Hunger Goes, but my mantra on addiction is, not why the addiction, but why the pain. Absolutely. And I just wanted to quickly comment when you talk about anger, you're like, adoptees are angry. And I'm like laughing, going, me, angry? I was like a raging lunatic. You know, like if there's a word stronger than rage, that was me. Hmm. It's kind of, but I feel there was so much grief around that. You know, that a lot of that is the grief that had to, to sort of come up. And what saddens me is the self-hatred, the cutting, the, the using against oneself. The, the well, hold it. Hold it. Everything has a reason. The cutting is self-love from a certain point of view. When I talk to people who cut, I said, well, I don't see what's wrong with it. I say, what's right about it? What does it do for you? And the usual answer is, it gives me a pain I can handle that replaces a pain that I can't handle. No. And furthermore, when you cut, that releases, the pain releases, relieving chemicals in the brain called the endorphins, for a while you feel better. So like everything, everything has a purpose. And so that even the self-cutting is a form of self-love in the sense of the organism trying to survive something. Hmm. I like that. I like the way you look at that. Um, and how would you say relinquish people's health can be affected, you know, generally in a lifetime? Well, so um, <clears throat> I've already talked about the documented mental health implications increased rate of suicide, anxiety, depression, ADHD, and so on. I don't have the statistics on um, physical health issues, such as chronic illness like cancer or autoimmune disease, but I've studied those issues and I've written a book about them. They're also responses to childhood stress. So my guess would be that adopted kids would be at higher risk for autoimmune disease and for cancer as well, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, and so on, for reasons that have to do with childhood stress, which then gets embedded in the body. I can't go into the physiology of it here, 
my book on that subject is called When the Body Says No. It's been published. Yeah, that's wonderful. 25 languages internationally. But I think that those dynamics of having to suppress your emotions in order to get along with the environment, and then that self-suppression of emotions plays havoc with your immune system, my guess it would be much higher, or at least significantly higher amongst adopted kids. I know adopted a, lot of, yeah. a lot of people have asked, you know, I've had questions and been <coughs> asked before, you know, there's no statistics. Well, I, I know that in the Journal of Pediatrics, they have the statistic about adoptees being four times more likely to attempt suicide. Yeah, yeah there's lots of, lots of statistics. Yeah, and you know, in treatment centers, I know when I've spoken in treatment centers and to the mental health profession, they say adoptees are always overrepresented. Yeah, for good reason. Yeah. Good Sarah, reason. Could I just come in with a question? Yes. Um, somebody earlier on this evening, uh, a really interesting question I thought to put in here. They said, I'm an adoptee, but my addiction to alcohol began when I had my search and reunion with my birth family. And that's when they, they say they started to spiral. And they wondered if you could maybe talk to this uh, reunion trigger for addiction. And, and uh, yeah, I'll just leave that there with you. I'd love to say something first on that, if I may. Um, what I have learned about the reunion experience, I found my birth mother when I was four months sober. That was the first thing that came up with, for me was I need to know who I am. Interesting, right? Drugs and alcohol went down. What came up was I need to know my story. And I didn't know at the time, but what I believe now is that the reunion experience is when the grieving really starts. And when the relationship, when you meet, is when you really start dealing with those primal issues that Gabor was talking about. And I have to say, being newly sober and searching, I had no support because I just thought, I know what I'm doing. You know, I knew nothing of what I was doing. And I would barely make it out her door, literally howling all the way home, howling in a way that I'd never even knew you know, what existed within me, but it was all coming up. And um, I think it is a very, very vulnerable time. And I always share when I work with addicts, I say, please, if you're gonna start reuniting and you're newly sober, get support, go to support groups, talk to other people because you are gonna get in touch with all that baby stuff. That is exactly what happened to me. And I don't even know how I stayed sober. Have to admit, I did eat bowls of chocolate at the time to get through. Sugar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I don't have anything to add to that. I mean, I think it's just the fact that that reunion, like somebody wrote on the chat that when they heard, the first time they heard their adoptive, their birth mother's voice at age 30, it's like they remembered the voice and there's something in you does. And so, all those baby issues will get triggered. And that's a very volatile time. And for the mother too. And the other thing, when you were talking earlier, Gabor, and you were saying about the adopted parent, you know, wants the baby, what is the expectation, <coughs> right? The adopted yeah. mother's like, but I've adopted you. Why aren't you connecting? And yeah. then I met my birth mother and she was like, can't you just forget about the past? And here we are now. And I'm like, no, I, can't, I don't know how to. I don't know how to. So what I learned, and I think for other adoptees too, it's so painful because the, your whole life you have this void. And you know, I know we're not supposed to have expectation, but you do. I felt that she was gonna fix the void in me. She felt I was gonna fix the void in her. But the sad fact was, yes, it helped, but I still had to go and do the work. And she did, and then you get angry at one another. So I think that that's, you know, to be aware of that as well. Um, what do you think, Gabor, the impacts of generational trauma? I mean, I don't really know on relinquished babies. I think about my children, but... Um... Well, all trauma is, virtually all trauma is multi-generational. So that the birth mother, who is a single mom, who's an ad uh, addicted or an abused mom, She's already been traumatized even before she got pregnant. And she got tra traumatized in her family of origin by parents who themselves are traumatized. Right. So that, so that this trauma is not personal. It doesn't begin with you as, as a book 
of that title says. Uh, it's just multi-generational and it's passed on both psychologically and it's passed on epigenetically. Epigenetically means not through the genes, but through how the genes are activated. So you can stress the grandfather and uh, that stress, to put it very simply, can be passed on to the sperm, to the grandchild. Oh, God. So that trauma is always multi-generational. It's, it's rarely, rarely just individual and personal. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, there, there are, gosh, there's about three or four questions about from adoptive parents, you know, and I'm going to sort of pull them all together because they're very similar. Their children are having issues, interestingly, with sugar, a lot of addictions to sugar, low self-esteem, self-harm. Um, and they're all around the same age as 12, 11, 12 years of age, a couple are from China. And, you know, these adopted parents are really struggling with, you know, how to help them self-regulate and what can they do um, to support them. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, with all the respect to everybody, it's almost impossible to give you a satisfactory answer in the short space that we have here in a short amount of time. But first of all, you have to look at your own emotions. What happens for you when your kid behaves in a certain way? Because if you get upset, you start feeling tragic or you start feeling angry. If you start accusing yourself of being a failure or of accusing the child of anything, you've already lost the game. So the, if you wanna help your child self-regulate, you have to learn self-regulation yourself and you need to work on that. This is true for all parents. And that's difficult. It's much easier to try and fix the kid. You know, you think if, if I only fix the kid, I'd be okay. Well, very often children have a way of triggering our own stuff. So that's the first point is you have to deal with your own emotional states because from an upset emotional state, how can you possibly teach self-regulation when you're not regulated yourself? So that's the first point. The second point is you need to see the child's behaviors not as bad behaviors, but as representations of emotional pain and attempts to soothe that emotional pain. It, just if you make that shift. So then rather than focusing on the behavior, oh, this kid is in pain. Well, if you, if you approach them from that angle, your demeanor will be very different. Your whole approach will be very different. Thirdly, a lot of adoptive kids, um, just kids in general in this culture, but because of their troubled attachments with adults become too connected to each other. And now kids are looking to each other now and, and for nurturing and for modeling and how to be and how to walk and how to talk. And so they're gonna take on the values and behaviors of the peer group rather than of the adults, which is unhealthy for them. Because throughout human evolution, it was adults who initiated kids into adulthood, not other kids. So, um, somebody asked on, on the chat line, which of my books would I recommend? Well, I would say that from the point of view of parenting, I'd recommend two of my books. I think anybody who reads them, regardless of the kid's diagnosis, is going to get a lot from them. The one is on ADHD. Um, the American title is Scattered. The Canadian uh, British title is Scattered Minds. It'll teach you a lot about child development and child behavior and how to deal with it, whether your kids got ADHD or not, I promise you. And the other book is called Hold On To Your Kids, Why Parents Need To Matter More Than Peers, which is about actually how to deal with kids' issues. Now, beyond that, let me give you a wonderful resource that's got nothing to do with me personally, except in the sense that the second book that I mentioned, I wrote it with a psychologist called Gordon Neufeld, who in my mind is the world's deepest developmental psychologist. And W.W. Gordon Neufeld, N-E-U-F-E-L-D dot com. He's got videos, beautiful videos on, 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 on the challenging child, on the teenage child. I think he's got videos on adoption as well, um, on bullying. Nobody understands kids like he does. 
So if you check out Gordon's website, any, any one of his DVDs would inform you immensely. To sum up the answer, children are acting out their attachment pain, trying to control the behavior. If a kid is self-soothing with sugar, trying to control that, you're never gonna get anywhere. You're gonna have to put up with the sugar eating and work on the relationship. So the child will become, feel really good about themselves. When they do, they'll stop soothing themselves. All the rest is in my books. I can't say more about it here, but it really has to do with looking not at the behavior, but what's driving the behavior. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, that's good. Um, we're getting a lot of questions. I do see, and I am going to get to those there. I, there's just one more here. Somebody had asked about, um, can you speak to the profound trauma, prenatal violence that occurs to infants born of criminalizing incarcerated women, which is further compounded by relinquishment? And we, we probably covered that, but... Uh, um, how can we do better for marginalized, vulnerable, pregnant women who are still criminalized? Well, I mean, I've, 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 I've worked with such women. Um, <clears throat> for example, um, I remember one case where <clears throat> a woman was in jail because of drug charges and the baby was born in jail and they wanted to take the baby away. And I, I wrote this letter saying, look, the worst thing you can do to this baby is remove them from the birth mother. And the baby stayed with the mom and did very well, actually. <clears throat> what can I say? There's no, look, the more stressed the mother is, the worse for the baby. That is, it's that simple. The more stressed and less support, worse for the baby. So that's what I can say in answer to this question. And and very often, of course, the criminal justice system has got zero understanding of human emotional needs. It's all about controlling or punishing human behaviors, but it's not about why did this person behave this way? What are their needs? How do we rehabilitate them? We talk about the correctional system, but the correctional system doesn't correct anything. It makes things worse because of the way we treat people. So that example of the incarcerated mother is, uh, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, <clears throat> unless that incarcerated mother is a threat to society, they shouldn't even be in jail. Right. They should be in some facility where they're supported and that baby's supported. So that what should be the priority? The need to punish the mother for something she probably did out of trauma in the first place? or the need to nurture this future life. So it depends what questions you're asking. Right. When I say what questions you're asking, what questions is the system asking? Is the system asking, <clears throat> excuse me, how to support human beings and infants? Or is the system asking how do we enforce our rules? They're not the same question. Thank you. Somebody's asking, what are your thoughts on using inner child therapy to address these issues in particular when it comes to those using substances? Well, I mean, I think there are many good therapies out there. Inner child, <clears throat> which really um, invites a person to recognize those emotional patterns of pain and lack of self-worth and abandonment and rejection and self-loathing and to take care of that child the way the child needed to be taken care of in the first place but perhaps wasn't that's good work yeah and I, I don't think there's any one method of therapy that i can recommend that works for everybody but 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 that's certainly one of the ones that points in the right direction, for sure. I mean, I think what is really challenging, and I've done a lot of stuff with teens that are using, you know, still using drugs and alcohol, and the parents, you know, really are beside themselves with fear and worry, and they know that they have to work with the adoption piece. 
I mean, I know in your book, you know, and I think in the realm of Hungry Ghosts, you know, you worked with people in a way they were still using, but you still managed to very slowly get them to talk about what was going on. I think it's hard sometimes for people to know what do we focus on? Do we get them sober first? But what if, what if they can't? Well, let me tell you something. A few weeks ago, I gave a talk to a group in Canada called Mothers Stop the Harm. And these are all a couple hundred women who all lost adult children to overdoses. Mm. Now, of course, it's extraordinary open-minded and courageous of them to speak with me because they know my perspective, which is that addiction is a response to childhood pain and trauma. And so these moms were ready to confront the reality that the death of their adult child resulted from pain that the child had suffered under their care in a family origin, not through their fault, because they themselves have been traumatized in childhood. It's just, again, the multi-generational transmission of trauma. Um, but, and I'm trying to remember, can you remind me of the question? Because I just, there was a reason why I brought that up, but now I forget why I did it. What did you ask me? <laughs> um, oh, about using drugs and alcohol, that's right. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, got it, yeah. So, these mothers had almost been uniformly when their kids were teenagers were told to use tough love. Now I'm telling them, I'm telling you, there's no such thing as tough love. There's tough or there's love, but there's no tough love. By tough love, you mean punishing the child and controlling the child and rejecting the child. For those parents who are asking that question, I really recommend you read my book on addiction. And there's a chapter there for families and caregivers. And I'm telling you, if at all possible, maintain that relationship and say to that child, look, I'm really unhappy what you're doing, but I'd rather you tell me what you're doing than not tell me. And understand that right now, this habit of yours serves a purpose. And I'm not going to force you to give it up. I'm worried about you, but let's stay in relationship. Um, I don't want to be, enable you or whatever that means, but I want to support you and be with you and be connected with you. And let's maintain this relationship. And I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to reject you. I'm not going to exile you. I'm not going to condemn you for the fact that you're using. That's the only sane attitude to take. Trying to fix the kid, coerce the kid, um, tough love, predictably, are going to result in worse consequences than you wanted to imagine. Yeah, it's, it's a, it, it is a hard path. I mean, I do feel for people in that. It, it, oh, so do I. Look, I've, yeah. it is, it is I've, I've broken my teeth many times trying to trying to fix my kids' behaviors, you know. Me too. It doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't you know, work. I think it's that thing, too, you know, I'm looking at all these questions and I'm thinking, you know, there is a lifelong impact to being adopted. And I actually believed when I was younger that when I grew up, I wouldn't be adopted anymore don't know where I thought that and I didn't realize that all these milestones because people are asking do things continue into adulthood yes absolutely yes. for me in fact maybe they're even more highlighted you know death of adopted mother well now both my parents oh my god so profound you know having babies all these things can re-trigger but I think if we really learn about ourselves do the work do you know go to support groups conferences i mean i really do believe in um surrounding yourself in the community where people can have had similar experiences where you are safe to really work through it i mean for me you know 12 step program has been incredible it's not for everybody but it's a place to put the drugs and alcohol down and then start doing the other work no one place is going to give you you know everything um so you know people are asking somebody said do cellular memories continue into adulthood for me they do but i'm able now when i have that feeling now i go oh hello 
I know, I know what you are. And it's like they live more, you know, and I've had days where they have totally consumed me again, especially death of parents, where the grief has been so intense. But I was able to say, okay, just sit with it. It's going to pass. You know, it might take a week or whatever. Um, but I think it's very frightening when you don't know what that is. And for young children, you know, they don't know, like you're saying, we just act out. You just behave badly because you're trying to communicate that way. You know, um, I can only echo what you're saying that the work continues for a lifetime. I'm 77 now, I'm still working. That's okay. It does get better, it does get easier, it does get lighter as you learn more and you get more conscious. Um, there's one question that you sent to me a couple of days ago, Zara, that I wanted to address, okay? Which is, how do you deal with the pain of not having been wanted? Okay. Well, again, this question is not unique to adoptions, but it's almost universal amongst people who are adopted. This may or may not help you, but consider the possibility that even though you experience not being wanted by your birth parents, it's not true that you weren't wanted. You wouldn't exist if you weren't wanted. Life wanted you. Life wanted itself. Life wants life. There's something much greater than individual human beings. Those individual parents were not up to looking up to you. But here you are. Something must have wanted you. Life wanted you. And certainly, of course, I don't know to tell you that your adoptive parents, however imperfect they might have been, as people are imperfect, they wanted you. So it, yes, there's pain there because of that, all the, all the reasons we've been talking about. But that you're not wanted, that's a story. It's true in a certain context, but it's not true in a larger context. I'm not saying you shouldn't have the pain, you have the pain. But don't make a fixed story out of the pain. And when you learn to want yourself, by the way, in the present, that pain will be gone. Because ultimately, you're the one that doesn't want you. You're the one that doesn't accept you. And that you can learn. Yeah. Oh. It's not easy. It's worked, like Sarah says, but it. I it's, get goosebumps when you say that. That is so beautiful. Life wanted you. I have never heard anybody say that before in all these years. It absolutely makes me teary. It is so true. I mean, one thing I always think, it's not that easy to get pregnant, actually. You know, yeah. it's only a few days a month. I mean, isn't that crazy? I didn't even know yeah. until I was older. It's like, oh, it's not that easy. And, you know, all of us adoptees, I mean, the randomness. You know, yeah, and think of, it, of, 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 all, of all the different eggs and the millions of sperm that might have met to create you. It's a miracle. Yeah, I mean, my birth father, I now know, has seven children with six different women. And most of us were just, he just kind of met one. You know, he must have had a radar for like fertile women, which that happens yeah. to. You know, the one-nighters and here we all are. So yeah. Life wanted us. I'm going, I'm going to be saying that to myself a lot. And again, that thing of um, of turning it around from the self-hatred, which is what I experienced as a child, because I wasn't, um, you know, I was reacting abnormally to a normal situation. So that became... I hate myself. I hate myself because I'm not doing it right and I should be more grateful and I should, 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 should. And then as you get sober and maintain it saying, I have to start loving myself. I always say, how would I treat another person? I would never treat another person the way I treat myself. Yeah. And somebody's asking about babies, you know, as adoptees and the way I mother is, is so different to my experience. Um, and it's, it is just very healing. And, you know, other people are talking about, um, you know, different adoptions. So the way I look at it is we have our relinquishment, no matter what age, we were relinquished by our mothers, right? So that's one thing we all share, no matter what. 
And then there's the adoption, which is going to be different. Yeah. So in a way, it's like you're dealing with two different things. Yes. You know, depending. Somebody saying, talk about the spiritual. Well, I think you have. Life, life wanted you to me. That's a very spiritual experience, you know, feeling. And they say, well, they say, who is they? I always say, they say, <laughs> whatever I read. We choose our parents, you know. Who knows? But I like to think. Yeah, about you know, I don't. I, I, I mean, people have certain beliefs, uh, which I'm not going to either argue with or endorse. I don't remember choosing my parents. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure that any infant in their right mind would choose to be born Jewish under the Nazis. You know, I, I don't go there. You know, uh, if somebody wants to believe that, terrific. But I got nothing to say about it. And you know what? Um, spirituality is so individual and so personal that uh, Absolutely. I'm in no position to give any prescriptions. Somebody uh, saying, is abandonment from birth father known to be as traumatizing as that from birth mother? No, it can't possibly be because the father, I hate to say this as a male, it just ain't that important. I'm talking from nature's point of view. Mm. Now, the father is important from the child's point of view. Of, 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 of a stable, supportive presence, but the father's first job is simply to support the mother. I mean, long before the father can make an appearance in the child's life, the child is developing inside the mom. And then nature would demand that, nature, I say, I'm talking about evolution, would demand that that child stay uh, connected to that mom for years and years. You know, what the in Aboriginal cultures and in, in, in hunter-gatherer tribes, where human beings evolved for millions of years, hundreds of thousands of years. You know what the average weaning age was? Four years. Well, fathers, bless their souls, can't breastfeed. You know, so the, the mother is the world for the child. This is, I'm not blaming women. I'm not singling them out. I'm just saying this is how nature intended it for any mammalian creature. Now, so the father in the beginning, the father becomes more and more important as the child gets older. And, it's, and he's important right away, helping to provide the nest. You know, like a neighbor of mine, um, he's got uh, some kind of a tree and woodpeckers come and they start banging with their, their beaks on, on, on the trunk to, to make a nest inside the tree. It's the father who creates the nest. So yeah, fathers have a role to play but their connection with the infant can't possibly be as deep in the beginning. Right. I'm not talking about their love for the child. I'm talking about the infant's needs for nurturing is all directed towards the mom. That's just how nature created it. It's well, not fair, so but it's it, just how it is. I, I did find that I didn't even think I had a father, actually, until I mm -hmm. found my mother. And then I was like, oh my God, there has to be a man involved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and... Um, and when I met my father, not until my 50s, I met my birth mother at 23 and I met my birth father at 51, you know, thanks to Ancestry DNA, no more secrets. I felt a very strong connection with him. I have right. to say immediately with my siblings that side, there is a very strong, I don't know, it's like I just knew him. We just connected. It's hard to describe. So... And, and I, I, Sarah, I'm playing with you a bit here, but I hate to ask you this. Well, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you tend to be attracted to relationship with older men? Seems so, yes. What a surprise. <laughs> Do you think I have father issues? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, we all carry these issues. And, and, and the thing is, it's just, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm just saying that. The, these, pattern, these patterns are set so early, you know, so that, and, and, you know, we, we tend to, um, we tend to reenact our childhood throughout our lives. Well, my adopted yeah. father never spoke to me at all, yeah. nothing. But I yeah. have to say, when I met my birth father, the first time I met him, I was like, oh my God, he looks like a boyfriend I had when I was 14. I am not kidding. Wow. Wow. How weird. Anyway, moving along. <laughs> yeah. Um, somebody has asked a very important question, who I know, Miguel, who has a wonderful um, 
adoption support group, adoptees and addicts support group uh, based in California, which I attend and I love it. And he's asking, it's very clear to me that the origin of my issues related to the, are related to the abandonment relinquishment, but how does an adoptee deal with all this tra trauma and move forward? Like what else, what other tips? I mean, you've talked about some of it, but yeah, you know, well, a lot of stuff. Well, so look, so let me mention again, a couple of resources for you. That's what we're gonna, I promise you we're gonna help. And I know it's self-serving because I'm talking about my own work, but. That's the work that Great I do. Here, <laughs> um, so, number one, my book in the realm of Hungry Bo is Close Encounters with Addiction. You know, um, it's a bestseller in across North America and in other countries. Um, and then there's a there's a group called there's an organization called Wholehearted, Wholehearted.org, and they did a video with me talking about the healing of addiction and it's a beautifully produced video we be working with people it's about eight hours i think you can get it you can pay for it if you can afford it organizations can get it or you can get a scholarship to get it and all you have to do is contact wholehearted.org and 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 we're very happy to make it available for you if you can't afford anything you'll get it for free wonderful and I you know from personal experience, I mean, I have found how have I moved forward and I still obviously we always have a lot of work to deal with. But but I know I'm in a place now in my life where I feel like it will always live alongside me. The grief and yeah. the loss will live alongside me, but it doesn't consume me. And it used to consume me. It yeah. used to be that I had no control over my reaction. And I really think it's just that time takes time. You know, I've always gone to meetings. I never, somebody also had asked, you know, how I got sober, why I got sober, because I had to, because I was killing myself and I hated myself and I had no self-esteem. And my brother was a heroin addict and my father was a judge, you know, living that whole crazy thing, right? And my, my brother was adopted terribly abusive physically abusive verbally abusive and a father that didn't speak to me I mean my god I had all of that but I found that it's not being afraid to tell people where you're at like yeah. I you know even in sobriety I have done the most crazy things which I'm not going to share with you all but they're not healthy you know I've done some unhealthy stuff at certain times of recovery but I've always shared it. I've always told somebody, I'm a nutter, I want to do this. And they're like, probably not a good idea. Maybe you want to think about that. And I've learned more to laugh at that part of myself. And I don't fight against it in the same way. Wonderful, isn't that just like in the 12 steps group movement, when you want to use, you call your sponsor. Right. You tell somebody. Yeah. So, to, just to have the awareness that these dynamics are arising in you and then to reach out for help. Right. That's a great way to begin, for sure. And, you know, going to, like, when I first went to 12-step AA, NA, Al-Anon, all the stuff that I've done, and then walking into an adoption conference, joining groups, hearing other adoptees, sometimes that's all we need is just to be a, someone to be a witness to us, I think, for, it, yeah. for things to shift and not being afraid to actually sit down and maybe just cry. I mean, I cry at everything now. My kids are like, oh, for God's sake, mom. You know, I'm like, oh. But I sort of accept that's just still what I have to do. And it will probably calm down more, you know? And to the, and, and to the extent that there's a adoption community that you can reach out to. Yeah. That's just so important. And, mm. you know, including today's, the sponsors of today's event. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And moving, you know, what's happening now, we've got sperm donors, we've got egg donors, you know, sperm donor um, children, adult children are showing up in our communities with the same feeling of wanting to connect with their families, you know, their fathers. Um, I mean, do you think... Do you think they're biological fathers? Yes, they're trying to find biological fathers. Now that may be difficult because, I mean, I've read articles about fathers who've got hundreds of kids out there i know but from the impact the trauma piece you know so you've got egg donors so now you have like eggs sometimes being bought 
carried right. in another woman, given to another woman. Yeah. Do you feel that all that trauma, is it, is it different? I mean, I don't know. You know, it all depends on, it raises all kinds of questions and probably it's too early to know the answers. But even then, you know, somebody really wanted you. Otherwise you wouldn't exist. And um, it depends how it's handled, you know, like parents trying to get pregnant go through a lot of anxiety. There's all these permutations now of sperm donors, egg donors, surrogate mothers, all this kind of stuff. I think if we just realized that these pregnancy stresses and then the separation from birth mother all have an impact and the whole environment, the agencies that are involved, the adoptive parents, they're all aware that this child has special needs. I mean, all human beings have special needs, but in these children, the attachment wound and the stress wound is just that much deeper. So they need a lot of patience, a lot of understanding, a lot of not taking their behaviors personally, adoptive parents, not being disappointed if the child isn't as responsive as they'd hoped they'd be, um, or if the child is too clingy for that matter, on, at, at the other end of the scale, that these all have reasons. I think it just takes an appreciation of all this. Yes. Uh, yeah. Because it can be very selfish sometimes, parents are like, I just want a baby and I'll get it no matter what, and not realizing that there's going to be an impact. You know, the egg, it's like you're saying the baby, um, it starts in utero. So now you're putting other people's eggs in other women. We don't know the impact of that yet. We don't. But again, I think if we take the attitude of what are the child's needs, yeah, it's, then that, that'll serve us well. Yeah. Somebody's asked, you know, how did the importance of connection, how do we get better at connection if adoptees have no modeling? and they fear abandonment. A lot of adoptees writing, but I have fear of abandonment, I have fear of trust, like you've experienced. What else could you could you say to people? Well, so first of all, to recognize that that fear is well-earned. You've earned that fear. That fear arose from your formative experiences. There's nothing wrong with you for having that fear. Problem is it doesn't serve you in the present because it doesn't reflect either the present reality or your present capacities. I mean, when my wife doesn't show up to pick me up, okay, so I took a taxi home, you know? So I'm not that infant anymore, but when the emotions arise, you think you are. So, so the thing is, yes, you've earned the right, if I can put it that way, to those emotions and those conceptions, um, but they don't serve you. And so, and they don't reflect your present capacities because you're much more capable now than when you were an infant and this first happened, number one, number two, it doesn't reflect the present situation. That's when therapy, that's when self-work comes into it. If these patterns keep showing up and you realize that they're based in the past and they don't reflect or serve the present and they create problems, that's where you realize I need help. Yeah. I need help. And then there's all kinds of help available. Yeah, and I think um, absolutely to, to keep remembering it's not present day. You know, I have to say to my boyfriend, you have to understand if you don't call me back, I think you're dead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's like, you know, I mean, let, you know, that's the first thought, you're yeah. dead. Yeah, and I know yeah. I was in the shower. <laughs> you know, you can laugh about it, right? But it's so extreme. But yeah. again, I think it's just learning that about oneself. Um, yeah. So we have like a few more minutes. I don't know, Debbie, if I'm missing any major questions, because um, it's hard for me to keep up with all of this. There is so much coming in. Yeah. So in... There, there have been a couple of questions around actually mum and for the mother whose child is removed from her. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not her choice. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you feel there's anything there to that we could usefully talk about in the few minutes that we have. But and if not, just to recognise that that is a question. Um, no, I mean, I'm, unfortunately, I used to see that all the time because when I worked with an addicted population and that group was down to on his side and these women were addicted to heroin or cocaine and so on, their children were never really taken away from them. Almost inevitably, they were taken away from them. But rather than making an attempt, how can we support this mom? Even if they're using, how can we support them? Because they really wanted to love their kids. Most of them really did. They wanted to be with their kids. It was a major loss for them and, 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 and another trauma for them to lose their kids. Now sometimes, in some situations, just to protect the child, you have to enforce that separation. We do it far too quickly and without exploring what would we do to support the mom, to help them be with the child. Because having that child is a ter terrific incentive for moms to give up their addictions. But they may need some time. Why don't we support them? Yeah. You know, it, 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 it's not all these false beliefs that we're protecting the child. We're not protecting the child. So I think there needs to be a lot more leeway for mothers who are traumatized and therefore not as functional as we'd like them to be, to become functional. And agencies, social agencies, just they, for the most part, they don't get it. They just don't get it. And it's a trauma. It's a major loss. I mean, you know what makes me, I always think about these mothers, young mothers often, or even mothers using drugs. I absolutely agree with everything you said. They rush, I mean, in America, I don't know really anymore what goes on in England, but they rush for them to sign the relinquishment papers. You know, before the woman's even had the baby sometimes. And I just want to say, let this mother give birth and have her baby because the feeling once you've had a baby is very different from being pregnant, right? Mm -hmm. And and yes, of course, we have to keep babies safe and children safe if their parents are. And there are horrible stories of parents that are abusive. We know that. But for the mothers that really want it, I'm always like, why can't you adopt Everybody, <laughs> adopt the mum and the child. This 15-year-old drug addict is going to be 20 one day. You know, maybe she can get her life together. Actually, there's a wonderful documentary Sheila Gans did about um, addict mothers, same staff talking about losing their babies and how they... Um, they, you know, were all put in this facility together, this home, and they were taught how to... Um, to nurture their babies but if they were using drugs and alcohol they had to know the baby had to go elsewhere for a while that's my dream i want to build like this huge place and put all the young mums in and keep their babies and let them go to school and you know i can hug the baby <laughs> it's like total fantasy but you know why can't we do that to help everybody i don't know it's just not set up that way the the chat is absolutely full and buzzing and it's amazing to see everyone supporting each other with with great links um one of the things that, that has also been mentioned i i, I just happened to notice that the, as the chat was scrolling through was just the understanding that some of what we're talking about here is a very it's almost like a common condition a human condition isn't it this a sense of loss um actually many people can feel that um at, at, in whatever family situation they're in, they can feel like they don't belong. Yes, it's um, it's heightened naturally um, for a lot of adopted people, but it's very general. It's a very human. Um, it's a human experience. The, the, the sense of loss of not having been seen, or perhaps not having been wanted for who you were, touched. You know. Um, Thank God I make my living out of that. <laughs> if everybody was happy, I'd be out of a job. <laughs> well, you yeah. better not heal everybody too much. <laughs> You're helping too many people. <laughs> How would I sell any books if everybody was treated well and happy? You know? Well, we're talking about... Yeah, you know what, by the way, I often joke about it, is that all of 
this developmental science and all of this brain science and all of parenting science, what does it come down to? It comes down to this. If you treat human beings well, if you accept them and nurture them, they're going to be okay. And if you don't, they're not going to be okay. Yeah. All the rest is verbiage. Absolutely. And, you know, Debbie, I'm 